it's just connecting. So just a few seconds. <laughs> Kate, you're hey. live. Okay, I'm calling to back to order this regular meeting of council. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that this meeting is respectfully taking place on a traditional and unceded territory that's the Nahuas First Nation. Um, before we also get started, I'd like to do another acknowledgement. I think our acknowledgements um, to our First Nations uh, neighbors need to go beyond sometimes just a simple land acknowledgement. Um, as many of you are probably keenly aware, um, last week there was some breaking news regarding a um, pretty tragic uh, discovery in uh, Kamloops. And on Sunday, our uh, flag was rate, or was sorry, lowered to half mast for 215 hours. So all the council was aware of that and the email had gone out. Um, tonight, I would like to acknowledge the tragic discovery of the 215 children's bodies at the Kamloops Residential School. I also want to acknowledge the other lost children from all the residential schools across Canada and to the survivors and family, I also acknowledge the lifelong effects of the res residential school system on your families, your communities, and your culture. Um, at this point, I'm asking council to join me in one minute, uh, one minute of silence to uh, respectfully acknowledge all the lost children and all the lives affected by residential schools. So we'll start at one minute of silence now. Okay, thank you for that. Moving on in our agenda, we have, sorry, here. the start of our consent agenda. We only have one item listed on our, under our consent agenda. I'll make the motion that the May 19th, 20, or sorry, that the recommendations listed, listed for item 7A in the consent agenda be approved. I do have a second or second by Councillor Savage. I will call the question. All those in favor? All those that's carried unanimously. That takes us on to uh, public input. So the beginning of our meeting, there was uh, we were discussing the public input received. Um, we had four items on our agenda. Um, there was a question about one piece of um, correspondence uh, regarding, and this is again under the public input um, from the Lanceville Community Association. So a question was, uh, posed to staff, but staff had some de uh, technical difficulties at the time. So I don't know if staff is able to comment now on the receipt of um, input, um, it, whether, and, and when it's not, um, it does not have a name or an address uh, attached to it. So if staff is able to provide some comment or guidance on that, that'd be appreciated. Yes, yeah, certainly this is council's agenda. So it's always up to you what you do accept on your agenda and what you don't. We have advised the public in the past and through our website uh, to provide their name and address. Uh, it's best practice that with, uh, or my experience with other municipalities where I've worked, well, many of which have resident associations, is that correspondence coming from a resident association would be signed and uh, the name of the president or the secretary would be shown on the correspondence. Okay, uh, Councillor Gusbrock, go ahead. Yes, I'd like to move that council will not receive 
correspondence from any organization, including an association, unless the letter is signed by an individual stating his or her title, as well as a municipal address. Okay, so it looks like Councillor Proctor is seconding the, the motion. And, and sorry, just for clarity too, I should have added that if it was a submission for a statutory hearing, uh, staff would usually err on the side of caution and include the item. But for regular correspondence and meetings, it's up to council. So uh, again, we're kind of making a motion on the fly here, but we'll, if council wishes to proceed with that, we can, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a good discussion, but we are basically just a public input on our agenda. So, um, well, I, think, uh, I mean, permit it, and I have no strong objections not to permit it, but uh, I think it will lend itself to a good discussion. And I think we have plenty of time tonight. So go ahead, Councillor Gunsmart. Well, I, I think it's a principle of uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, you know, we're asked to make decisions and we're asked to, uh, uh, to listen to the public. Uh, but I think, you know, the public or, or an organization uh, out of courtesy, if nothing else, uh, let us know who's writing the letter. And if it's an organization, they must have a president or a director and uh, an address. Otherwise, uh, you get into the, you know, the Russian fake news or some, uh, you know, the, the Burt Lance uh, Memorial Society sends us letters. Well, who is that? You know, it's some fake organization or what? Uh, unfortunately, we know, uh, well, so that's, uh, I think that's the simple answer to this. So through to the seconder, Councillor Proctor, and then I'll start a speaker's list. I, when I look at the letter, I see that it's well-written and well-intentioned, but it's anonymous. I, I don't know who wrote it and I don't know um, who sanctioned it. And I, I, I think that that's an important piece of information. If we start accepting anonymous letters on our council agenda, I think it's a pretty slippery slope. It's, uh, I think that anonymously people can say a lot of things as we've seen on Facebook recently with all the fake profiles that people have saying whatever they think hiding behind the anonymity. So I, I think that it would be, um, very ill-advised of us to accept letters without names on them. And uh, so I have Councillor Savage and then Councillor Wilson, and I've got something to say. So go ahead, Councillor Savage. Uh, yes, I can't support this for two reasons. First of all, I thought there was a protocol for introducing motions at council meetings. Uh, I believe that it's either late item, properly done, with unanimous support or a notice of motion where a majority can decide to deal with it at the same time. So for that reason, we either have a policy for creating motions on council or we don't. And the reason for that, just out of interest, is for transparency. It's so that the public can follow what's upcoming on council meetings and have a chance to give input or to foreknowledge of what's upcoming. And if it's just willy-nilly motions all over the place during a council meeting, then the, the, you've lost that opportunity of transparency. And it's a whole idea of an agenda, putting it out, allowing the public to see what you're doing. And then the second reason is that these on the spot, uh, decisions, uh, not something that suits me because I like, and I think that we owe it to the public to have careful contemplation and, and research on items that are up for making policy upon. So uh, it's for those two reasons. And there's a piece of, in our agenda later, 
which I've already complained about that with no information basically about it. And this also happened last council meeting where we were given designs beforehand and so on. So that's bad enough, but to take it one step further and just to make a motion on the spot, which is now becoming policy, I think that should be done more properly during notice of motion or uh, a late item. So, uh, and I'm not ready to vote on it on the spot. I like to contemplate things more carefully. Thank you. Okay, so I did have a uh, Councillor Wilson next, but I, if Councillor Wilson, if you would let me speak just to uh, the you know motion, just briefly, I'm not speaking to the content. It's more or less just how the motions come about. So um, just, you know, my recollection at the beginning of this evening's meeting was um, we were having technical difficulties with our um, corporate administrative officer, their uh, director, Coates, and, um, or sorry, corporate administration. <laughs> Anyways, um, and, and so we couldn't really get the answers we were seeking at that point with respect to um, this correspondence at the time of adoption of our agenda. So. Um, just now as chair, um, again, I, I did somewhat uh, make a ruling uh, with respect to allowing the motion and not saying that was out of order and so forth. It's just because of the unique circumstances of this evening's meeting. So um, through to Councillor Wilson and then uh, and then I think it bounces back to me because I will speak to the motion and then I think I'd Councillor. And, and staff could add a bit more problem. when there's. Sorry, go ahead. Director and Coates. staff could add a bit more when there's an opportunity. To add to what staff can go ahead, and then I'll just I'll go next. Well, I just well, your next council was. I just want to know what staff is going to be commenting on before I permit um, staff to comment. I, I think the question was process for public input correspondence. So I was just going to reference the agenda, and the procedure bylaw, and the hybrid that we're currently doing. Okay, sure. That, that's go ahead, Director Coates. So the council procedure says public input period. Members of the public may provide comment only regarding items listed on the council agenda, ex excluding public hearing topics for that meeting, must first state their name and address for the record, and may speak once for up to two minutes each. The presiding member may provide additional direction respecting public input. So it's definitely within the chair's uh, purview. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that due to COVID, We've adjusted this because we, of course, as you know, we cannot have public in the chambers. So on our website, and in fact, at the top of the agenda, it says members of the public who wish to provide input regarding agenda items must submit written comments by email to district at lansfield.ca, mail or drop off at municipal hall and must be received by before 12 noon on Wednesday. And it's got the date of the meeting, providing your name, address, Agenda item number, name and comment will become part of the public record, be shared with council and posted to the website. The district does not accept anonymous submissions. This includes, includes emails with an email address only. So please include your name and address. So that is what we have published. And, but as I said at the beginning, this is council's agenda and it's up to you if you wish to accept things. And we have in the past, if this was a submission for a statutory hearing, uh, we would usually err on the side of caution and include it. But it's up to council. Sure, uh, Councillor um, Wilson. At this point, I can't unread the letter because I've read it. And so it's impossible for me to not consider it. I think just moving forward, it would be it would be the right thing to do for the, and I'm sure the Lanceville Community Association is watching to just simply uh, include the necessary things uh, within a letter. Uh, so for me to say that I won't be considering the letter after I've already read it, it's, it's kind of impossible at this point. So um, I'm not really gonna be, you know, a stickler for the details on something like this. I suggest that we just move on. I think this is good discussion. Um, but I think it would be appropriate for the Lancelot Community Association just to kind of refine their process a little bit. They're a new association, so that's understandable. And just maybe they should, they'll include an address next time with a signature from their president. And, and I'm sure that on their website, I haven't visited it, but there's a, a process for 
um, how they come to voting on a letter to be submitted to council. Um, I'd be interested in looking at that, uh, just making sure that they obviously have members, that they're all gathering, that they're all voting on, on, on a letter rather than it just being saying something, the president uh, deciding to write a letter on behalf of the association without a proper process. So I, I would think that I would hope that they have that process. Um, I'll, I'll review their website later uh, to find that process. And, um, and that, that's all I have to say. I can't read the letter. So I'm going to consider it tonight and uh, let's just move on. And uh, hopefully they'll refine their processes moving forward. So, and this um, is the point where I'm next. supposed to confess that I didn't catch the motion. I, I think I got part of it, but I did read what is the current requirement, what is published currently, and what is in the procedure bylaw. So perhaps if the mover and seconder could tell me if there's anything different in the motion that would require us to update one of them. Okay. So, Councillor Gesselbrock, uh, you were the mover of that motion. Yeah, I've got you, yeah, Councillor Wilson. Just add three. No, I, 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 I don't think there's anything different. I mean, that's why I brought it up. Here's the problem we come to a meeting, and sometimes hours before the meeting or minutes before the meeting, a letter shows up. And staff is, has really been good in getting these letters to us and trying to get it as part of the agenda, even though you know, the agenda has come out the Friday before. I'm trying to be fair by, by if, if we're going to make any other person put their name and their address, whether they're, they would be speaking in a regular meeting or whether they're sending in a letter, that's good for everybody. So that's, that's the intent of my motion. That, that was it. And I don't think we, uh, this is a procedural matter. Uh, and this is not a new matter. This is a procedural. And I think it's fairly simple. So yes, I agree that uh, my motion uh, really tracks uh, what uh, the current policy is uh, for communicating uh, on an agenda item before the meeting. Okay, so we had Councillor Proctor as the seconder. Uh, there was a question asked from staff if you wanted to comment, and then I was going to speak, and then I think Councillor Wilson after that. Uh, I have no more comments at this time. Okay. Uh, for starters, uh, I see in our chat box, I don't know if anybody's noticed that as well. Um, there, there's been a comment. I don't know how that comment got there because I don't see that person as one of the callers, but it just reads from Rachel uh, Mundell or Rochelle Mundell, sorry. Um, I'm one of the LCA directors and I'm prepared to speak and put my name on the address to the email. So that kind of nullifies that, I suppose. Um, and speaking to the motion, I can't remember exactly what the motion was, but the, the issue I have is, um, you know, first of all, is, um, you know, how this even got sent to us, if, it, you know, if there's no name and address on it, and it's just simply an association that's not identifiable to anybody, you know, why is that getting forwarded on? Why is that even becoming part of the correspondence for our agendas? Um, I, I do review agendas with the CAO. But I don't go through every single page. In fact, all I ever look at typically is the first few pages as we have our agenda. But in terms of the supporting materials and so on, it's very rare there's anything more than just the few first few pages of our agenda. So, um, so I'm a little puzzled by that. You know, I think in terms of our procedural bylaw, I think you know if we if we want to make an amendment to that, that you know, council is will not consider any anonymous emails or whatever, then that's maybe the direction we need to go. I think right now, um, and again, I might have to get the motion re-read re here, uh, but I think what would probably make most sense is that we just direct staff not to forward on emails that do not have a name and address attached to them. I think that's the simplest solution to all of this is just, you know, correspondence doesn't get passed on to Mayor and Council, unless there's a name and address to it, needs to be verified. Just, yeah, Your Worship, just a just a point uh, I want to make to you uh, concerning this letter. This came in after you and I uh, reviewed the agenda. As a matter of fact, it just came in today. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, I just again, it's not um, anything to do with the association. It's just again, I think with any correspondence, it needs to have a name and address. I don't disagree with that one bit. So. How council wants to move forward, uh, you know, we do have a 
a person or a resident, and I believe this resident spoken before on behalf of the Lanceville Community Association pre prior meetings. But you know, if someone was just to randomly pick up this evening's or you know, the minutes from this evening's meeting, they're not going to know exactly who's um, you know part of this Lanceville Community Association and so on just by simply picking up our minutes. So it needs to be you know we need to have some mechanism in place and. Um, and maybe through to um, Director Coates, do, can you, are you able to read back the, the motion? I don't know if you got it or not. Um, no, I, I am not. But I did want to clarify that these are interim procedures that we're doing while council, uh, public cannot attend the chambers. Once uh, the public is able to attend the chambers again, we will certainly be reverting back to people willing to stand up and speak unless council directs us to bring forward an amendment to the procedure bylaw. So the procedure currently allows people to submit up until 12 noon, the day of the meeting. So that leaves us a very tight time frame to try to then uh, take the letters received by noon and put them up on the website and then email them out to council as a link. The minutes do not reflect who provides public input uh, because of the way in which we're receiving it, but the submissions go on to our website and are available for the public to see. So I could totally understand that for the public, it would be confusing when they're looking at this letter and it just has the name of an association, but there's no uh, reference address or name. So we can- And thank you for correcting me. I, yeah, I meant, you know, in terms of the letter, it would be it would form part of the record as being part of an agenda. Won't wouldn't be on it and then and accounted for in the minutes. So, I believe I have Councillor Wilson, and then um, and then well, I think what would be more appropriate. We already have the mechanisms in place for whether we we don't need to have a motion to whether to on what needs to be in place. It's already there. I think the motion should be: Are we just are we going to accept this letter tonight or not? Um, like I said, it's already it's already been sent as a late item. I've already read, I don't I'm totally fine with it being on the agenda. Um, I don't care. But I think moving forward, I think that uh, I think the, the the processes of the Lancel Community Association will more than likely be refined. And um, let's just move on. We're beating a dead horse here. All right. So I did have Councillor Council Brack, and then I don't I can't remember Council Proctor. Yeah. Uh, accordingly, and I agree with Council Wilson. Uh, I'm going to withdraw my motion, and I think that we now have a clear understanding that unless correspondence um, uh, is sent in in accordance with the COVID uh, procedures and restrictions, that that letter will not be forwarded on to council. So I'm withdrawing my motion. Okay, so just uh, recognizing Councillor Savage, uh, do, is there anything you'd like to state? And then by unanimous uh, vote of council, we can just withdraw the motion. Uh, yes, I just think if this comes up again, I believe the proper procedure is that uh, this uh, issue is already uh, itemized in our procedure bylaw. So it's up to the mayor to make the judgment call you don't agree with his call, you can challenge the chair. I think that's the proper procedure. So I don't think we need the motion that's on the floor. The procedure bylaws are already in effect. So it's really in the mayor's court at this point, but I'd support withdrawing the motion. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna call the question. So by unanimous consent of council to withdraw the motion, anybody object? So no, no objections. Okay, so it's withdrawn. All right, so it's good discussion. And, and again, Councillor Gusselbrack, you know, acknowledging that you did send in an email and the discussion happened here tonight uh, at, at Council. So that's good. Um, Mr. Well, Mayor, just for clarity, we are on item eight public input period, but no one has registered to speak during public input. I understand there was a chat note, but that does not register someone to speak. Um, okay, yeah, I just, I, again, I don't know how that even showed up when. Anyways, I can, we can chat about that later. <laughs> I just I don't even know how it popped up because I didn't see anybody join our meeting based on my screen. So, all right. So that takes us on to um, item Sorry. ten. Uh, and she has registered since I started to speak. So, no, she's not registered. Oh, okay. 
Okay, because she logged in after the start, it doesn't show up, but she is there now. So if you wish to call on her as a speaker. Okay, so um, if, uh, Michelle, if you're, Mandel, if you're on, the, if you're on the Zoom call and you can hear me, um, if you can state your name and address for the record, and if you are speaking on behalf of that group, um, if you can state that and you have two minutes. Hi, yes, this is Rochelle Mandel, 6711 Alder Road. Uh, just apologies for the oversight on not adding the, my name and address uh, to the letter. Um, so yeah, that's all I really wanted to add and mention tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so, and there's no other registered speakers through to um, Director Coates? No, there are not. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item 10A of our agenda, so we have the official uh, community plan amendment that we have a motion on the floor from, oh, that was referred from February uh, 17th. And uh, so anyways, we don't need a mover or a seconder. I'll just read the motion. That I thought, for. I'm sorry, I, I just a point of, of information, I guess I thought we moved item 13A to right under oh, item three. Yes, you're correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Proctor. That's correct. We did move 13A. So um, we do have a late item that was introduced. So first, we just need to vote on accepting the late item. So I will, um, and I, oh man, just give me a sec here, folks. I just have to bring up the motion. Where is it now? I could read it out. If, if you know. could just read it, uh, Director yeah. Coates, that'd be appreciated. motion is, it's an uh, application for a permanent change to a liquor license for the Lansfield pub, that the District of Lansfield opt out of providing comments to the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch on the application by the owner of 7197 Lanceville Road to change the hours of liquor service on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 10 a.m. Okay, so just need a so a motion to so moved by Councillor Gustafbrek. And what we're actually voting on is now to consider it as a late item. So seconded by Mayor Swain. Um, any discussion on this being considered as a late item? Hopefully not. So I will call the question. All those in favor. Okay, that's carried unanimously. So now we're dealing with it as a late item. Does anybody need the motion read back? Okay, um, and through to staff, is there anything further to introduce this? Hearing nothing, uh, I'll move to council for discussion. So, or oh, sorry, Dan, mover and seconder. So now, No, I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> so for discussion, so I think Councillor Gesselbrock, do you have anything to add? And uh, for myself, I'm fine. Uh, Councillor Savage. Thank you. Uh, we ran into this with the Legion. So the, to me, the situation is this. It's really up to the uh, applicant to decide if a uh, uh, district letter of support will help or not or whatever. So question through the staff, if so requested by council, is it within the purview of being appropriate or regulations and so on that uh, uh, the district can send a letter of support to the applicant and they may do with it what they choose? Yeah, through the mayor to Councillor Savage, uh, no, it's it's actually very templated, the forms that are submitted through the uh, Liquor and Cannabis Licensing Branch. Um, so so a letter of support from council would not be appropriate, but I can I can say I, I've, I've spoken to the applicant in this instance. I, I think there's there's zero chance that it's not going to be approved by the branch. Yep. So in that case, then it's best to stay out of it, let the applicant handle it. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Okay, I will move to calling the question on the on this late item. All those in favor and opposed, that's carried unanimously. All right, so 
don't know why I couldn't find it in the email. All right, so that takes us on to um, 10A of our agenda now. So we have the official com community plan amendment. Um, so no mover or seconder is required. I'll just read the motion just for the viewership that an official community plan amendment be initiated to replace the density numbers, a number, sorry, in the official community plan with the actual density numbers identified in the 2017 community-wide survey. So that's what's already on the floor. Discussion on the motion through to council. I'll start a speaker's list. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Wilson. And Councillor Wilson, you are muted. Given that this is our third year into this and um, we have one year left in our term, I, I want to just kind of state that I, I don't have, uh, for the record, the the will, if you will, right now to support this. But I think it's uh, it's important that that the topic you brought up for discussion purposes. Um, I've read through um, the letter, and yes, unanimously um, agreed upon by council. But I think that we need to remember that there was a survey that went out that was per household. Um, that's a lot different than, say, a petition that goes out and three, re three residents sign at one home. And this happened, this has happened in our community. So this was, I think that we need to show, we need to recognize that and show respect to the survey that went out that was per household. And um, that's the only reason why I brought this up as per discussion. And I'm not sure as far as the, there was a, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable of another, like another community-wide survey. I know that there was a process after the first one, um, but it was only with a, with a sort of hand-picked, if you will, set of residents um, in that next step in finalizing um, the, uh, the so-called numbers that went into the OCP. And I think we also need to understand what an OCP is. It's a guiding document. It's not a rigid document. It's not a zoning document. It's a guiding document for the community. And if something comes forth our way, uh, that's great for Lanceville, I think we need to look at that. So anyways, I just, uh, I wanted to show respect to um, those that, that got the, the households, the 570 something households, or I'll say 550 in the 500s, those households that got that survey in. Uh, to the community and uh, recognizing that that was not residents that was households and that's what i'll leave it at but like i said i won't be supporting this for the simple reason that the amount of work that i know staff is burdened with right now um i just think that we have more important things to to go on to worry about so that's all okay so i've come to the next thank you um, I, I don't want to entertain this motion at this time, but I'm really glad that it's on the agenda because it gives me one more opportunity to outline how important I think that the data from the community wide survey was it's the only um, statistically valid data that we have that we had during the OCP process and it was the culminating activity of the OCP process. There were a few very small gatherings asking people for feedback after the um, the OCP uh, survey household survey went out and there's been so much misinformation uh, put out into the community about the density numbers and the correct density numbers that it's actually appalling the correct density numbers are the ones that are from the the community wide survey that is what the community agreed in they weren't discussed at the kitchen table meetings or any of the other things that I've heard people say we discussed it and no, the density was discussed in the survey and statistically valid. That is what the community wanted. So I think it's really important that we squash the misinformation about the OCP. The OCP is a working document that was created with lots of really good input. And uh, it unbeknownst to me why the numbers changed after the survey. I've spoken to people on the OCP committee and they're all a little befuddled about it too. I don't think it's worth changing the OCP 
but I do think it is worth validating um, the people that participated in that survey. And it wasn't easy because the makers of the survey did such a good job trying to make sure that everything was explained, that it was kind of onerous to tackle the survey. I did hear that complaint. It was hard to figure it out. The reason it was hard to figure it out is because they went over and above trying to explain everything to everybody. I don't think that um, this is the time to consider an OCP amendment to make those changes for whatever reason those numbers were changed after the survey is unbeknownst to me or anyone on the committee that I've spoken to. Thank you. Okay, additional speakers. I see, I think, Councillor Gusselbrock. Yeah, I, um, I approach this issue a little bit differently. Um, as Mayor Swain will recall in our last council, there was a di divergence of opinions as to whether to put in a density table for each of these special plan areas or not. And at the end of the day, uh, that council decided to kick it over to the new council. Uh, the new council inherited uh, the unvoted um, on OCP. And at the end of the day, uh, we voted on what I'll call a compromise. And uh, that instead of putting in hard and fast uh, density numbers, we opted for the wording and the guideline density numbers that are in the current OCP. But the OCP will be changed. There's no doubt about it. Uh, as it should be, because what we did as a council, and, and this happens in other communities, is that, uh, if you will, we downzoned uh, the special plan areas. Uh, uh, most of them were half acre. Uh, we put in the zoning, uh, in the uh, zoning bylaw that uh, unless they brought an application within a year, that uh, they had, uh, that the best they could do were 10 hectares, which is impossible. So it was always uh, um, it, it was always presumed by council and staff that any new application by a developer, whether large or small, that the OCP would have to be amended, uh, depending on what council decided for a particular uh, zoning app, uh, for a particular application, and that not only the OCP but uh, most likely the zoning bylaw would have to be amended as well. And that's what bylaws are for, to be amended. So um, it's a bit of a tempest in a teapot, I think. Uh, we will come up with this uh, issue uh, on the next application that comes in for one of the special planning areas. And I'm sure there'll be lots of debate, but uh, uh, sure, sure as shooting, uh, we are going to be amending not only the OCP, but most likely the zoning bylaw. So I, I, at this point, I'm not going to support this motion as well-intentioned as it was. Okay, additional speakers on this item. Okay, we have Councillor Savage. Thank you. A few quick items, please. I've talked endlessly on this. I'm certainly not going to again. Uh, First thing is anyone who asked for an extra survey got it. That was a complaint during the process that uh, only one was sent per household. So anyone else that wanted one was given it. So in a number of cases, they, there were more than one person in the household that filled them out. And the uh, its consultant was the person who wrote these numbers no one else. We had no input whatsoever on what the numbers were going to be. We found out when the survey was done what he decided the density numbers were be. So they weren't grassroots numbers at all. The acreage was wrong in Upper Lanceville, so the total units were inaccurate compared to the 3.6 units per acre. And I think people would have been quite happy that worked out to 191 units for Clark Med. I think people would have settled for that just fine, those with the survey numbers. Uh, so I also think the submissions on the last three zonings are also valid. Their actual input on actual rezoning applications, they're far more valid than a theoretical concept of this 
magazine style survey that went out that was just chock full of information and pictures and so on. I would take the input on an exact rezoning application on a special plan area far more, it's far more valid than just a, you know, a, a rough indication of supporting a right, large point of information. survey. Point yeah, of information. Just two seconds, uh, Councillor Savage, a point of information is being requested. So Councillor Proctor. Um, I'm wondering if you have a reference in qualitative and quantitative research methodology to back up your, uh, your assertion. Okay, so Councillor Proctor, if you want to debate uh, later uh, after Councillor Savage has finished speaking, that's fine. I well, think I think he should state that it's his opinion. Well, you can, I, I think when he's, any member of council speaks, we're basically expressing our opinions on the various issues that are before us. Okay, I accept that. That's Councillor Savage's opinion about qualitative and quantitative research. Yeah. So Councillor Savage, you may continue. Yes, I also have a point of order, please. And if you want to state your point of order, Councillor Savage? Yes, I really like this to stop. Uh, every councillor has a right to speak without being interrupted. And if it's a procedural matter or something important, fine. If it was just to argue with the councillor, it's completely inappropriate. So I'd really like this to end, please. I've got every right to express my opinion as much as anyone else does. So thank you. Okay, so, Councillor Savage, your point order is noted. I, I, again, like what I'm going to reiterate is when any member of council speak, including myself, we're ultimately expressing our opinions on each item. If council so wishes on every topic to, you know, every time we speak um, to state in my opinion, we can do that. I just think it's implied that when we do speak to the various matters and issues and when we debate them, we're ultimately expressing our opinion and ultimately expressing our opinion based on what we think is uh, representing the view of residents. So anyways, that's uh, not really an item to rule on per se, but I, again, I, if, if they're, I guess for point of information, if something is of concern, like in terms of incorrect information or what have you, um, misquoted number, would, um, I think that would probably be the appropriate time to bring that up. So, yep. so ahead, uh, Councillor Savage. Yeah, so, uh... At any rate, during the OCP process, uh, people were not prepared to give a blank check to the special plan areas. Just, oh, that's nice, you just do whatever you want. They wanted to know how much stuff, how much density was being planned in exchange for park plans and so on. And that's how these numbers came about. And it's extremely common in OCPs to have density numbers. Nanaimo has them. They're all over the BC. So Departure Bay has them, units per acre, and so on. So, uh, so that's, that's that. And in terms of what we passed, flexibility was one thing. I'm all for flexibility, but just throwing out the numbers was not the intention at all. It was just to allow some flexibility in case something really spectacular came up. That was the idea, but the numbers are there. And I think the really important thing here is to remember is the legality of what's in the OCP in terms of density numbers is completely irrelevant. These numbers mean something to residents. That's the key point. And in every special plan area, we rezone that area and we have an OCP amendment. That's exactly the process for every single special plan area. So we can legally amend the OCP to anything we want during a special plan area process. So the legality of these numbers is not the question. It never has been what it means, it's a, it's a rock solid indication of what residents agreed upon in the community plan. It gives them a seat at the table. And without this guideline, you're dragging residents out to every single rezoning application from now until, you know. So that's the idea is put it to bed, put it to rest, let council and staff deal with it. We've given our numbers. So now if we're throwing out the numbers, it throws everything back up in the area. 
that is the essence of the numbers in the OCP. And at this point, I think if it was reopened, the OCP, the density numbers would be lower, not higher in terms of the mood of the, what most of the community feels. But at any rate, I'll certainly support not proceeding uh, with this because for one, it would take a good year to fulfill the amendment. And number two, I believe in asking residents what they want, not telling us what we want in terms of density. And the, <clears throat> the third thing is that, as I say, I think the density numbers would be, oh, sorry, the third thing is that it's an impossible thing to translate all the boundaries of village south, lowlands, and the village commercial core have changed. So it'd be very difficult to translate density numbers at this point. And what's more, uh, you have to consider the park plan too. You can't just keep the density numbers in the survey and throw out the park plan. So, so anyway, I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Oh yeah, so I've got myself down next and then I believe Councillor Wilson and Councillor Proctor. So I'm not gonna belabor this too long, but I've taken a bit of a different track on this uh, issue and debate um you know the, the one thing i think we need to alert our residents to is that council has just undergone its strategic priorities they're posted on the district website um under the strategic 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 sorry priorities uh for the next couple of years or to guide us to the end of our term we haven't really we have not included this as one of these items however um we also have on the on the district website the the list of uh District Lancel's big choices for 2021 to 2023. And under um, bullet four or number four on that list is we have the OCP timeline. So, and under that we have next steps. And that's for council to consider deferring a con comprehensive review of the OCP to 2023, which is obviously beyond our term. Um, and in the short run, consider minor amendments as needed. Now, the one thing that, you know, in looking at the big picture with OCP is we, we went from having an OCP from 2005 to then adopting one in 2019. That's a long time span to, to really go with, uh, without having an OCP review, even a minor review. And, and then with that, um, obviously some, you know, there's been some differing of opinions on it and so on. But like anything, uh, you have to give it a test drive for a few years. And when you really do the math, uh, you know, from 2019 to 23, 2023, that's only a four year test drive. So I think, you know, even if we look at doing a comprehensive review at that time, which I'm totally in support of, because um, I think it will totally settle things down in our community, um, that would probably be about the right amount of time. And that's when the big changes can be made. You know, we, we all recognize that the document is not a rigid document, it's, nothing's etched in stone. Uh, however, you know, the one thing I've always argued is it, it should give people some certainty, no more uh, than what it gives a developer when he picks up, he or she picks up the document and reads it. He goes, okay, this is what's expected in this area. Um, but, you know, like anything, uh, you know, if anything major comes along, and I, I kind of use the George Cuffism of, uh, of, you know, first heard deferred. So if, you know, if you have a big ask or change required with OCP, especially in this early test drive period, um, even if it's to 2023 and within that four year period, I, I think it needs to be moved on. Unless we're looking at minor changes, minor changes, let's do them. But when it comes to big changes, um, we got to proceed cautiously. Okay, so those are those are my thoughts at this point. I have Councillor Wilson down and then Councillor Proctor. I'm not gonna add anything else, thank you. Okay, Councillor Proctor. Thank you. I uh, would just like to take a minute and apologize to Councillor Savage because my quest for factual information was not meant as an insult and I would never intentionally insult a fellow councillor and I would appreciate it if I got the same respect in return. Okay. All right, so with respect to this item 10 B, any additional debate? I think this one has been 
talked about, or sorry, 10A, we've uh, probably talked about it long enough in the past and in the present as well. So unless there's new information, I will call the question. Okay, hearing none, I will move to call in the question. All those in favor and opposed, noting that Councillor Savage is opposed, Councillor Gesselbrecht, Councillor Wilson, and Councillor Proctor and Mayor Swain unanimously opposed. Okay, that takes us on to item 10B. So we have the estimate of police costs increase when population five or when 5,000 population. So the motion's on the floor, no move or second are required. So again, for the viewership, I'll just read the motion that staff meet with appropriate provincial representatives to determine Lanceville's policing requirements at population 5,000 including the number of constables required by the province. And based on this, staff give an estimate of the police costs increase when Lanceville reaches population 5,000. So that's what's on the floor. I'll start a speaker's list. So I see Councillor Proctor, you already have your hand up and then Councillor Gesselbrecht and I'll go from there. And then Councillor Savage. Go ahead, Councillor Proctor. I can appreciate, thank you, Mayor. I can appreciate that this is unfinished business. However, I think that we discussed it wholesomely at our strategic planning session and um, came up with a strategy um, there that um, does not support this motion. And I think that um, we also have discussed it at, I, this is the third time we are discussing it. And I think that we discussed it wholesomely at our strategic planning and came up with a, a way to approach it. Thank you for that. Uh, actually, I was going to um, see if staff was going to comment uh, about, I, just I know in my discussion with CEO Campbell, I, um, uh, there might be something about the financial aspect of it, but for finances, like staff is um, followed up, but maybe CEO Campbell, if you can just provide a little bit of information and then we'll continue on with the speaker list. Yes, Your Worship, uh, through you to council. Um, our former CFO did uh, contact the province. Uh, the province advised us um, that it's probably too early for us to be discussing uh, the concept. Um, all that's really, you know, for council consideration is if we should start putting money away now. And um, I think our interim director of finance has uh, some suggestions or consideration for council. Thank you for that. So I have uh, Councillor Gusselbrook and then Councillor Savage. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree. We should probably be proactive and plan. But um, uh, as Councillor Proctor said, we had quite a discussion and there were some statistics that uh, when we pass 5,000, um, that that decision is depend uh, that the, de the decision to look at increased RCMP costs most likely won't come on for another 10 years. In fact, even more because it's based on the census and uh, likely it won't, it won't be this census. It may not be the next census. It could be the third census, which actually states we're over and then the mechanism kicks in to what we have to pay. So. Um, I think what we should do is defer this discussion uh, to uh, a staff budget meeting and to a council budget meeting, and that's probably the appropriate time to look at this. Thank you. Okay, so I've got uh, Councillor Savage. Yeah, this is the uh, simplest of simple motions. It's just to get a rough idea of what we're looking at with the police cost increase. It, it, most municipalities plan ahead for years with this. Duncan did that. They plan for years and years. It doesn't have to be exact, just a rough idea. I can do this myself. I've already done it. I already know approximately what it's going to be. But I'd like an official number so that uh, we can hang our hat on it. So if we are putting things ahead for it, we do it very slightly and incrementally over a long period instead of huge increases I've, I've talked to a number of municipalities throughout BC and, and they were hit with an enormous wallet uh, from Nacusp, which is a hub for the hinterland. They have an unusual amount of pubs. They, the province told them they had to have, I believe it was eight constables, which was an enormous hit on their budget. 
uh, will be likely required to have about four, which will be about a 450,000 per year increase when that happens. But it just makes sense if you're just wanting to know the cost of a new fire truck. So you can start putting a, away money 10 years in advance. So I don't see how this is the least bit unusual. And in terms of phoning the province, all you have to know is say, look at what, what's the likely amount of constables you request for our area. And it'll very likely be four, but that's all we need to know, how many constables. And all you have to do is compare to Qualicum, a chosen, other areas on the island similar to ours. The chief financial officer of Qualicum said it for their area, and he's heard elsewhere, it works out to about 175,000 per constable. That's all in for facilities, support staff, and so on. So uh, that's all. All I want to know is to, so we can roughly know what it is, and so we can plan ahead for it. So it's such a simple request. It's uh, something that's easily done. That's all I'm trying to achieve. Thank you. Okay, so as a first time speaker, I'm going to go next, and then I see Councillor Proctor, and then Councillor Kesselbrack, and then uh, and then if Councillor Wilson, if you want to speak. Um, so again, I'm, I'm bouncing back to our recently uh, um, created strategic priorities of this council, and under eight community safety, we have explored this establishment of a police reserve fund. So I'm assuming as staff works through this uh, list of strategic priorities for this council right prior to the end of our term, um, information will come back to us because we need to have some goalposts on, on what the likely financial increase or burden is going to be when we hit 5,000 or population 5,000. Then if we, well, no, so if I go to the next thing, which is district and landscape big choices, again, on our district website, and then you go down to, um, where is it there? Oh, yeah, under five police reserve fund. And again, it says next steps remain to be considered by, remains to be considered by council and the near term staff could bring forward an analysis of the needs and costs of establishing a police reserve fund. So I think through the council, we know we need to start putting money away, right? We need to put it in the little piggy bank for the police, policing for the future of, uh, <laughs> sorry, no pun intended there. <laughs> I saw Gelser, uh, Gelser Brack, yeah, that's, that's a bad pun. Anyways, um, <laughs> so we, we have to put money away. There's, there's no doubt about it. We know policing is going to be more expensive as we move forward, it, it's a given. So I, I'm willing to be patient and seeing what staff comes back. They know this is important. We, we need to consider this in our budget or budgeting process for um, in the fall. And, and I'm certain that's gonna happen. So um, staff is listening, staff will, I'm sure will be reacting. But in terms of the motion as laid out, I, I won't be supporting it. Um, I'll be voting it down. Um, anyways, that's all I gotta say. So we, we got our strategic priorities. So I have Councillor Proctor, Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you. Just through you, Mayor to staff, I'm wondering what the interim director of finance's suggestions were. CAO Campbell mentioned that she had some. I'm not sure. If I may, through you, Mayor? Yes, yeah, go for it. Do you wish? So, I'll just give a slight summary of what I have in front of me for you. The staff has been in contact with the police services division in regards to trying to obtain some um, confident costing and as to how many constables may be required when Lanceville reaches the 5,000 level. However, um, at this time, they are not in a position to provide number of constables that would be required for Lanceville, as there are quite a few factors that need to be examined. And they typically do not do those until a bit nearer to the time, because as you can imagine, a lot changes in costing over, you know, a five year period, like between this census and then the next census. They are willing to um, provide a presentation to council if interested. Um, on 
providing council with an overview of structure and funding of policing in BC, as well as a high level overview of the process of a potential emerging municipality and the work that they would do to assist that um, transfer. Currently, uh, if the 2019 RCMP police statistics um, is published on their website and two recently uh, two recent municipalities, Armstrong and Peachland, they each have four uh, members as yes. Councillor Savage commented. And there are different costing because constables cost 70% to the municipality. However, the support staff and accommodation is 100% cost to the municipality. So costs do vary. For example, in 2019, Armstrong, their four constables cost them $526,000 for the year. And in Peachland, their four constables cost them $698,000 per year. So there's a variance of what it could cost and that would all depend on discussions between council and the police services as to the type of service council is looking for. Um, so, for example, if we used those estimates and said it's possible, it would cost Lanceville between six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars a year to provide policing um, on the high side. But it's musing six hundred to eight hundred. That would be a twenty-five percent to thirty-three percent tax increase to the taxpayer, because currently a one percent tax increase, as I'm sure you're aware, is just over $24,000. So that's, you know, 25 to 33% increase. So the average home in Lanceville pays $1,643 in general municipal taxes. So if we added the police tax to that, the, police, the cost of policing to that, the average taxes would increase between up to $2,000 to almost $2,200. So a four to $500 increase per average home. Of course, currently the average home pays $150 in the provincial police tax, which would disappear when that transition happened. So net, it is still a $250 to $400 increase to the average taxpayer or 15 to 25% increase. So the options that staff could bring forward would be how you want to implement the increase up until the estimated time. And there are options there. You could put all your money, put all the money aside or just gradually get your tax rate up to what you expect it to be when police services come into effect. But staff will bring forward our report with that information. So you have it in front of you and that can be done at budget time if that is your preference. And if you would like police services to do a presentation, we can arrange that for you. Thank you. Thank you. That Thank was you a very that. thorough presentation. I, I appreciate your answer. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have Councillor Gesselbrock. Oh, I wasn't done. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor yeah. Brock. I, I think that we should um, ask staff to bring this forward to us at budget time, because I think that we, we probably will want to look at increasing taxes incrementally, but uh, not for 15 years. That's just my thoughts. So I think we should bring it forward at budget. And um, that was a great presentation. I look forward to hearing more. Okay. Your Worship, uh, just a, a comment. Um, uh, Kathy did, or Kathleen did mention that um, the province is willing to come in and uh, do a presentation to council, uh, should you desire. Yes. Okay, thank you, CEO Campbell. And I have Councillor Gesselbrock next, and then I don't know who else is after that. Well, if I heard Councillor Savage correct that McCusp has not eight bars or eight pubs, I think, you know, we're off good. I think we can get away with uh, one constable sitting in a chair with a cup of coffee and a ham sandwich across from the pub, from the Lanceville pub, and we'll get off easy. So uh, I, I, I won't be supporting this motion, but I certainly look forward to dealing with the issue at budget time. Okay, Councillor Savage. Yes, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, 
thank you very much for that. That's all I wanted, so no need for the motion now. So very rough estimate between six and 800,000. That's exactly the amounts that I concluded as well. So that's good enough. That's rough enough for us. That's all I wanted. And I would urge council to seriously consider starting to put money away now. You've no idea some of the horror stories I've heard from uh, other municipalities like Oliver and so on about the huge increases they faced and huge tax increases because of this idea when you hit 5,000, I believe it's 30% to 70% of the cost you have to go for policing. So all I'm asking is to think ahead. And if we slightly increase the tax burden each year for many years, that's far more palatable than uh, you know, you ramp up incrementally and very slowly. That's far better than a sudden jarring leaping upwards that's hard on everyone. That's my only point. So I think that's all I needed to know. So no need for the motion anymore. Thank you. And I'm also of... very interested in that presentation at some point in the future by the uh, provincial government policing. Thank you. Sure, I was just gonna speak, speak briefly for a second time. Yeah, so with respect to the presentation, we'll just make that happen. It sounds like council is very interested. So I'll be sure to follow up CEO Campbell and just make sure that's happening, probably closer to our budget time as that would make most sense. Um, just in terms of general interest, and this is in a newspaper article from back in 2016, and the source, um, you know, they, there are sources that below it, but if anybody's interested, I could probably send the link out. But in it, it has the police cost per capita. And what you'll find interesting here is that if you live in Nanaimo, it's uh, $268 per capita. That's the policing cost. Down the list in Lanceville, $58. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I don't really notice, besides like maybe some of this traffic enforcement stuff and coming into our town and doing more stops and or speed traps and so on, I really don't notice much of a difference in policing service, but uh, in Lanceville, we get it for a steal. And, uh, and as we approach population 5,000, that will become less of a, a steal. So anyways, uh, Councillor Proctor, I saw your hand back up. Thank you. I just had one further um, question for the Director of Finance. If there's more households, which there will be because we have to reach the threshold of 5,000 households, wouldn't that mean that the tax, tax increase per household would be less than the figures you told us? Because you're basing it on the number of houses we have now. I hope my question made sense. To you, Your Worship, yes, it, your question does make sense. And yes, that would be a true statement. Uh, we are basing it on today's dollars. And when the report gets done, probably with some discussions with the director of planning, we might have a little bit better of an idea of uh, future expansion in, and base the figures on a, a future estimate. So basically, the more multi-million dollar houses that are built in the foothills, the less our tax increase will be. As Thank long as it, there's not a pub on every corner, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, pubs pay taxes. Oh, yeah, so I'm inclined to call the question unless there's any new information. Your Worship, just quickly. Um, yeah. Well, Director Young did indicate that it's probably, uh, we're looking at uh, um, probably 20 to 25 years out to reach that population. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna move to call in questions. So all those in favor? And those opposed, noting that Councillor Savage, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Proctor, Councillor Gusselbrock, and Mayor Swain opposed, unanimously opposed, the motion fails. All right, so that takes us on to item uh, 12A. So we have uh, Mayor and Council verbal updates. So I guess I'll start with Councillor Proctor tonight. I don't have a lot to update. I did, you know, I wanted to point out that our meetings are really different when they're on Zoom. And it is um, a lot more intense uh, experience for participants to have their um, portrait face on, uh, on, on screen for two hours. I hope that um, 
members of the public can appreciate that. Sometimes we, uh, it's not part of our um, procedure by law that our camera has to be turned on. And if we need a break or we're eating a cracker, we could turn the, prop, the, the uh, camera off. I also wanted to point out that all of us have been issued a um, district laptop. And the reason that we were given these is because sometimes our agendas are up to 500 pages long. And even though we have changed to this format and we're uh, in our own homes, I still refer to the agenda off a different electronic device so that I don't have to print out the 500 pages. So I'm sure that it has been noticed when this screen is on and I'm looking at it, I'm sure that you can see that I'm looking at a screen and I simply wanted to explain um, what the reason for that was. That's my husband's phone, he left it in this room, I'm sorry. Um, that was all the updates I had for tonight. Okay, so that goes to uh, Councillor Kesselbrock. Nothing, thank you. Uh, Councillor Savage. Thank you. A uh, couple of quick things. Uh, first, thank you very much for that moment of silence tonight. Uh, I know personally, I just want Snanawas to know that uh, you'll find probably without exception, everyone in the community supports them at this time. And the second thing is uh, a long time teacher at Seaview School, Lindsay Miller is retiring. And uh, so many of us have had our kids in her class. So uh, she is also, her class has provided the snowflakes for the Christmas decorations in the village. So uh, I wish her well in the future and thank you for all your years of service in CB School. Boy, it brings back memories. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Councillor Wilson. Uh, some of a really cool experience. Uh, I got a call uh, regarding the fact that we at the marsh, uh, just around the corner from us on the property here, have uh, there was a, a wet a western painted turtle nest found. Unfortunately, somebody um, drove over the nest. Uh, don't know who that was. It's on the far corner of the property where. I, I never go, uh, but I got to participate in uh, moving some sand so that they could build a nest and got to feel the uh, the uh, the eggs that uh, are like, um, they were almost like um, just pieces of leather that were opened. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a, just a neat experience uh, that there's uh, quite a few Western painted turtles apparently in the marsh uh, off of Siwash and Normorell there. So that's all. Uh, for myself, um, just a couple of brief updates. So I attended the virtual ABICC or the Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities uh, Association um, annual general meeting. It was uh, really interesting. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was uh, definitely worthwhile attending. And I think Councillor Gusselbrecht would joined on that one. And from that, uh, for what it's worth, um, so I can bring it up. Oh, don't tell me I lost it. Oh, sorry, I got to change screens. Um, so just happy to report back that we had submitted a resolution um, to AVICC for endorsement and regarding the development cost charges for local government facilities, and uh, it was endorsed. So what that means now is um, that we'll move on to UBCM in the fall. And uh, from there, they'll be voted upon to see whether or not that's going to be moved forward to um, to the BC legislative and so on. So I just wanted to bring that to council's attention. Um, just also wanted to bring to council's attention with respect to the RDN. I'll be the chair of the transit redevelopment subcommittee. And uh, with that being said, I'm looking forward to bringing um, making sure that the profile with respect to transit within Lanceville is uh, definitely um, raised uh, and we've already submitted a couple of motions through to the RDN as you're well aware uh, with respect to transit rerouting and requesting hours and so on and uh, so I hope that um, we'll 
um, keep our community engaged during this whole process. And as uh, new developments occurring here, we got the Clark Med property going in. Uh, there's 250 houses going in there. That's going to definitely cause uh, probably a rise in um, ridership. But the one thing we have to appreciate with transit is it's something you just can't flick a switch on and increase your your busing overnight or or add routes and so on. It's a it's a Bit of a process and and unless you have the um unless you can really demonstrate the desire to for the ridership um to have increased routing and and frequency and so on it makes it really difficult the other thing we have to you always have to take into consideration is that there's competition for the hours that get allocated uh, through um, bc transit every year to the different transit authorities so um with the rdn being one of them and it's not always um, I guarantee you that, you know, whatever hours get allocated to the RDN are going to flow through to your municipality. So unless you can demonstrate you have a strong desire in your community or area to have increased ridership or, um, or routing and what have you, um, it probably won't happen. And there's a lot of competition for these hours uh, that, that get allocated uh, to the RDN every year. And, uh, you know, and again, uh, what we have to do is just really raise the profile on transit within Lanceville, especially as our community grows and we plan for that growth to actually have, um, have the busing infrastructure in place and so on. And, uh, and I was pleased to um, see that the, the um, transit uh, bus stops were installed um, down um, on the highway uh, below the overpass. So uh, BC Transit has installed those and uh, and looks really good. So I was happy to see those go in. Um, and that was had nothing really to do with uh, us uh, or uh, Transit or sorry the RDN and the Select Committee. That was more to do with us. The Nawas uh, working directly with the Ministry of uh, Transportation. So they managed to um, successfully get those in place. So other than that. Um, I, that's that. Oh, and I, and I did attend the vigil on on Sunday. I took my daughter down there, and it's a very, very, very uh, moving experience um, with respect to the recognition again of the 215 um, discovered um, bodies in the Kamloops Residential School grounds. So, um, you know, some of the stories that were shared were very heartbreaking, and uh, however, um, it was a lot of song and dance, or not, sorry, dance, but uh, prayer um, and so forth that was offered. And that uh, was, again, a very moving experience. And and, uh, and it's one of these things moving forward. It's it's really about the acknowledgement and of this this dark history in, in Canada. So, and, and also, you know, the sharing uh, with respect to some of the individuals in uh, Nanawas as well, and how the residential school system has affected um, families um, in our own community. So, Anyways, um, it's uh, again, I, I hope that uh, it is my hope that, uh, you know, local governments and all the way through to the provincial government and so on can can do something about uh, this moving forward. So anyways, um, that's my update for this evening. Uh, moving on our in our agenda. So we have um, under 12B, we have the development permit application for 6953 Dickinson Road. I'll just simply make the motion that the development permit number DP21-17 be issued to property owner to the property owner for 6953 Dickinson Road. We have a seconder to that. Seconded by Councillor Proctor. Um, discussion on this um, through uh, I'm, for myself, I'm fine. I'll just move it on through to direct or sorry, uh, Councillor Proctor. Uh, any comment and through the rest of the council. Sort of speakers list. So we have Councillor Savage. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Savage. Yes, thank you. Uh, and with no disrespect to the property owner, they did their job. They maximized the efficiency of the land and so on. So that was a job well done. Uh, my role is different, it's to uh, represent residents and I'll be opposing this. And we were invited, if there's one bylaw we know of, we feel it's been broken, and I do. And it's what I've said from the start. And the bylaw is the Fisher Community Plan bylaw. 
and in particular, it's the uh, section that refers to uh, density bonus in parkland, and it reads, uh, the district may apply a bonus density in residential areas outside special plan areas without amendment to this plan where the development plan includes parkland acceptable to the district in addition to the required 5% dedication required under the Local Government Act and and the community amenity contribution. So with this particular lot, uh, it was uh, zoned previously in the previous zoning so by- Councillor Savage, sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you. I, I need you to speak directly to the motion and the motion has to do specifically with the DP application for and I'll read it, it is for the potential or DPA six, potential historic underground mines and DPA eight, which is a village form and character. We're not here to rehash the, the rezoning process or the OCP amendment. Yeah, with respect, the staff report says that staff can only turn it down if they can refer to some bylaw which has been broken and it mentions bylaws in general, and I'm giving the one that I feel was contradicted. Okay, I'm so if you can bring us to there quickly, that'd be brief. Yep, right in the staff report, and I'm telling you how it was contradicted. And the reason I bring up the previous zoning bylaw is simply that it was zoned for a two hectare minimum parcel size, the reason being it's already been subdivided. And my point is, Keeping that into consideration, this was a 1,200% increase in density. And if anything deserved this section of the OCP to be implemented, it's a 1,200% increase in density. And for that, we got no park plans, and the cash in lieu was only for 5%. Yet the OCP says we certainly have the right to ask for more than 5%. So in that respect, I feel that it's, it's, uh, it's been broken. And the whole key to this section in the OCP, it's identical to these sentences. You may release a prisoner where there is evidence of remorse in addition to him getting a job and buying a home. Next sentence, the student may go to the party when he has done his homework and cleaned his room. So the part A of the sentence is, the, uh, is what you get. Part B is the condition. And part B, the condition here, is clearly getting this amount of parkland and an amenity. This wasn't followed. So therefore, I won't be uh, supporting it. Having said that, the one good thing we did get out of this is the uh, fix up to uh, Dickinson Road. And if I just may add one last thing, it's my hope that we can put the uh, speed sign up before the changes to Dickinson are made so we can compare the difference between before and after how the speeds changed over say a two week period. This is critical because we have other hills in Lanceville to address this problem. Thank you. Uh, Director Young, I see your hand is up. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, just, just to, to uh, your comments, I just wanted to clarify what it says in the staff report, which is that council can only refuse the development permit because the proposal is inconsistent with the development permit guidelines in the OCP or a regulation in another district bylaw. All of the items that were just referenced were policies, not regulations. Okay. Additional speakers on this, or I'm gonna to move to calling a question. You see none, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor and opposed, noting that Councillor Savage is opposed, carries. Cool.
All right, so that takes us on to item uh, 12C. So we have the facility design request for expression of interest for public works and fire rescue. So staff is going to provide us with um, a verbal report through to staff. Your Worship, um, uh, Ronald Campbell uh, to council. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just correct um, on the policing, it's uh, 15 to 20, not 25 or 20 to 25. Population uh, years to get to that population. Okay. As far as this facility goes, it's a uh, it's a request for council. Just to let council know that uh, we're going for an expression of interest to uh, design both the fire hall and the the um, uh, public works yard facility on the five acres uh, that's being donated to the community uh, through the Clark Med development. Um, so that's really what it's all about. It's it's to get council support or approval to proceed with an expression of interest, which will come back to council at the time uh, for inclusion in the, uh, the budget process. We've been advised just so that uh, the mayor and council's aware, we've been advised that the fire hall site is compromised both um, uh, by our own uh, developments on the G property. And uh, we've been advised through a, um, a uh, traffic study that uh, our um, uh, Nanus First Nation did that the uh, current uh, fire hall site is going to be compromised in the future. You know, in addition to the, uh, the provincial report of 2000, I think it was 2005, uh, indicating that that intersection will uh, on Superior Road will wipe out the fire hall site. Thank you for that. So through to you, uh, CEO Campbell, what you're asking from council council this evening is a, is a motion to have this added to our financial plan for for next year. It's just to advise. You have muted. Sorry about that. Uh, it's just to advise council that we want to go for an RFQ uh, to get an expression of interest to design uh, both the fire hall and the uh, public works yard site, um, which will be located on the five acre. You're now muted again. Not quite sure why that happened, but nonetheless, I've spoken with both um, the director of public works and the fire chief, and they both feel that site would be an excellent site for a fire hall and public works. Also for council to be aware uh, with the public works uh, yard site currently, They've outgrown the site. And secondly, we spend roughly $36,000 a year on that site to rent it. Okay. All right, so through to council. So I see Councillor Gusselbrack and Councillor Savage. Go ahead. So we can um, debate this. I'd like to make the motion as follows. Council directs that staff proceed with requesting an expression of interest for a public works and fire rescue building, plural, I have a seconder, I'll yes, speak to Councilor Wilson. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Gusselbrock. Yeah. Uh, my, under <clears throat> my understanding from speaking with staff when the CAO Campbell says that the uh, current fire hall site on uh, Superior Road is will be compromised <clears throat> is that there was a report back in 2005, which most of us, if not all, were unaware of, saying that this site at some point would be used for some sort of a, some sort of an interchange at the Superior Road and Island Highway. Uh, my understanding from speaking with staff is that, uh, uh, depending on what happens to the G, not even what happens with the G property, but uh, with uh, whatever plans the Sanawas First Nation has, that that uh, interchange will become a reality, which means. You know, we shouldn't have even gone to the province in the first place to ask uh, to buy that land because it's already been spoken for. But, uh, you know, that's just the lack of corporate uh, 
corporate memory, I think. Um, secondly, um, that we are paying $36,000 a year for a municipal yard, which is in the industrial site and uh, uh, it's difficult to get a hold of staff there uh, on the regular uh, on cell phones because of the lack of cell coverage, uh, which in my view is a safety problem. Uh, besides that, I understand that there's other, that that site is also being used for other sorts of storage, which is making it uh, more and more difficult for staff to bring their own equipment in. So um, in line with uh, other discussions tonight about planning for the future, uh, I think this uh, uh, motion to get staff working on uh, the financing aspect of getting a municipal yard and a fire hall uh, built on that uh, space, the five acres on Clark Drive, which is accessible really much better to all, uh, uh, all areas of Lansfield, uh, including the foothills, including what will become the Clark uh, Drive, Clark, Alger, Blackjack area uh, in case of a fire. So uh, that's why I'll be supporting this motion. Okay, um, Councillor, I think Councillor Wilson, you second it. So if you want to speak to it, and then I will move it to speaker's list. Well, I, I will, I'll just state that I, I mean, I, I agree and I support the motion. And I was honestly shocked when we did our, when we were newly elected and we did the facilities tour and went to the, uh, the industrial park to see where our public work staff work out of. Uh, not only when you say the cell phone issue, I would say more so the, uh, the lack of railing walking up the stairs and in that building would contribute a lot more to the uh, lack of safety. Um, the building is just, uh, yeah, it's, it's not suited for public work staff. And not only that, it's, um, it's we're, we're throwing $36,000 in my opinion away when we could be putting that, having that with our own building. So um, anyways, that's, uh, that's all I will add. So yeah, I will support this motion. Okay, uh, Councillor Savage, I think you had your hand up. I'm highly disappointed in this. The agenda has one sentence in it, something about uh, putting out some proposal for some designs. I wrote a letter about this complaining, saying why on earth can't this be on the agenda? All this information we just heard was not included in the agenda. I'm hearing it for the first time. I've already spoken tonight about on the spot decisions. And here we go again with an on the spot decision, just like the last council meeting when we weren't given the designs for the beach road ends. This is millions of dollars we're talking about. And here we're given this information briefly, right on the spot. And we're supposed to now be making a decision to go ahead with requesting designs for this. I have a real problem with this. I would prefer a fulsome information and time to contemplate it to come up with the best design requests. If we're going to approve of this, the last we talked about this land was November 16th when I made a motion to for the land use of these five acres. And I was told uh, we withdrew that postponed that motion out of respect to what the planner said that it's best to you know, get ownership of the land before we make decisions on it. So if we're making decisions on this land, I want that to be the first question answered. What do we want there? And if it's decided we want the fire hall and public works there, then we do it in a way where it's special. We get the best design possible. And the best way to do that is we go to the, come up with our ideas for what else could be on this five acres in terms of multi-use. We get public input, they may come up with further ideas and we get a design that's a multi-use design, which is beautiful, including the whole five acres. That's the way we maximize the best design for this, not in isolation but I don't even wanna make that decision tonight because I'm hearing all this for the, uh, for the first time. So I think it's important that we think of everything that can go on this land. We get consensus 
of everything that could go on it. We get the public to give input and so on. And just one example is you could have a, a fireman's uh, skill circuit, workout circuit right on this land. And you could also have a kid's fireman's circuit right on the land. There's two ideas just right there that could be incorporated into the design. So I want like more time to do all this and this is flat land. So if we can move any of this up to the foothills like storage for uh, public works is not as critical as the location of the fire department. It can be put in smaller areas on the, uh, in the foothills then save this valuable flat land for its highest and best use. Now in Nanaimo, they're just looking at getting upgrades to their uh, public works, uh, $200,000 for uh, an architect to come up with a good design. And they've got, I think it's in the neighborhood of about uh, 12 acres there. So that shows you the size of a place that might be needed. So we wanna think long-term here and if it's better to be in the foothills where there's endless space, if that's how big you need your public works, then let's think ahead. That's just another aspect of this that hasn't been vetted. And the reason it hasn't is because this is on the spot information. So that's, that's my thought on it is this should be deferred to at least one meeting so we can all think on what are some of the uses make our decision of the uses we'd like to see there. I'm hearing for the first time now that uh, we had always looked at the fire hall current location as being a viable option. And now we're hearing for the first time that it's not. So uh, that's what I would prefer. Let's think on this. And if we're doing something for Clark Med, which has been controversial, let's give it our best shot. So there's something of the highest standard there. And if you're putting it out to design, we haven't even decided what level of construction we want. Do we want the highest leadership example of energy step code three, four, or five for these buildings? Or do we want the lowest building standard we can get away with? We haven't decided any of this. So we can't go out to a design process until we know what we want. So all these things we should do, and please, if we're wanting the best we can do for this five acres, can we please give it more than five minutes thought as to what's gonna go there, come up with a comprehensive, beautiful ideas and a beautiful plan to go with it. Uh, you know, we're doing something for the community. Let's make it the best it can be. And I'm with you on that. Whatever you decide, I'll support it. And let's make it the best it can be. Not just some off the cuff, sure, let's get some designs. Designs of what? To what standards? Do we want innovative, spectacular architecture at the same price or, or what? So do we want a theme? Do we want to coordinate it with multi-use? These are the things I want to discuss. So. I'd be happy to hear ideas and so on tonight, but I want to defer this decision, please, till at least next council meeting, and then think about public input. We get some great ideas from the public. What are some things they want there? Thank you. Okay. So Councillor Proctor and then myself and then Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you. And I, I guess I can speak for eight minutes because that's what Councillor Savage just did. Yeah, my apologies, Councillor Proctor. I didn't time, start the time on him, but uh, yes. If we can all I, be. I'm fine with that as long as it's open for all of us. I think that it's really, really important for all of us to consider the tr extensive training we got when we became councillors. And uh, our training certainly indicated that we don't publicly criticize staff. I think that staff has done an incredible job bringing this forward. We have been discussing the fire hall since our very first strategic priority session. They're doing exactly the right thing. They're asking simply for an expression of interest so they can bring the appropriate information forward for us to discuss at a budget session next fall. And without this, we won't have that information so that we can discuss it. I am completely confident in cat staff's ability 
to direct this process, to design buildings, and to uh, look after the best interest of council and the community. I, I wanna make that really clear. This is the proper procedure. They're asking us to, um, to endorse the expression of interest so they can bring forward information to us at a budget meeting where we can discuss the fire hall that we have been discussing since we were elected, but nonetheless, it does need to be discussed and vetted. And without this expression of interest and further information, I don't know how we could even begin to have that discussion. I'll, um, I'll give my extra five minutes to somebody else. Okay, so for myself, um, this is obviously an interesting one. I, I wasn't fully aware that we're going to be moving a motion this evening on this. Might have missed something. However, um, you know, my concern is designing, you know, obviously we're going to be designing a fire department, but um, with respect to the public uh, works facility, what, what scope are we designing? I, I don't understand. For me, we could throw up a couple uh, ATCO trailers on there. As long as there's shower facilities and a meeting room, it's done. We don't have a lot of public works staff and, and why we need to create a big building with all sorts of bells and whistles doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. We're a small municipality. Um, what are we building? Um, you know, so I, I would like to see some more information coming back in terms of design requests. I, I'm, I'm not fully understanding of the motion. Um, you know, I can understand, you know, we were looking out at projected growth of the community and what would be required from a fire department standards. Uh, that's kind of probably a lot simpler um, and exercise for staff to go through the certain parameters and standards that need to be followed when de uh, designing um, fire halls and um, and they can probably come back with a pretty good pr uh, price on that or an accurate price. But in terms of the facilities, I don't understand what that's gonna look like. Um, why not move the whole district hall up there? Doesn't need to have an ocean view. Um, you know, these are some of my preliminary thoughts. I don't understand what we're, what facility is going to be designed or the scope of that. Um, I'm very reluctant to even consider passing this tonight or voting in favor of it. I would like to see a little bit more information coming back. Um, not everybody, I guess, is on perhaps equal footing with respect to the knowledge regarding the fire hall and uh, the current location of the fire hall and how that uh, may... Um, or how it's likely going to be affected in the future, or we won't be able to have a fire hall there in the indefinite future. So um, perhaps that information can be brought forward. You know, all we're talking about really is one meeting. Um, and sometimes this is the thing about, you know, like um, this council, we've really just dealt with everything um, in council meeting situations, but something like this, I think would have probably been better dealt with in like a committee of the whole kind of environment, but we don't have that option and being on the, under the gun sort of thing to make decisions in a council meeting environment um, isn't always easy. And then I think sometimes if it's not, if it, it's not that time sensitive, we're really just talking about perhaps bringing something back to our budget discussions um, for this fall. Um, if there are requests of individual members of council, get them in and let's uh, process that and deal with that next meeting. It's two weeks away. So, you know, for those reasons, I, I won't be voting in favor of the motion tonight. In fact, I'd rather just defer it to next uh, council meeting. And and if there's questions for um, staff, um, then to submit those questions, have them answered. But I really don't know what, what we're designing. Yeah, we've talked about the fire hall a lot. We've talked about, uh, yeah, 36,000, three grand a month. You know, that's uh, not a ton of money um, when you really don't have any skin in the game for everything else that goes into uh, you know maintaining a building and everything else so in some ways it's not a bad deal but i would agree with the previous speaker on this it's not the greatest of facilities but i think moving forward you know a couple of echo trailers would do the trick so um i think i had councillor wilson and then we have councillor proctor and then councillor gus brock oh you're muted councillor wilson I sense some aggravated tone here. I think it's pretty basic. I mean, I don't think we need to make a mountain of a mole here. And I, I don't think that we're going to have a facility at the end of the day that 
looks uh, looks awful. And I agree with Councillor Savage. He kept saying the, the term beautiful and and I don't know if in, I'll paraphrase him, an amazing um, good use of land and maximize it for uh, for that around that Clark Med development. I think that this is just simply a start in the process here. We just, uh, and, and I, I, we've been talking on council since the very beginning that uh, our public works facility is uh, is not very good. I disagree, Mayor Swain, with the ADCO trailers. I think that we need a little bit more than that uh, to properly uh, service the community. Um, and, you know, we knew that the fire hall was also uh, um you know, we've been talking about this for, for three years. So I, I don't see an issue. This is just a start in the process. And we're not asked, we're not, we're not voting on a design tonight. That's not what we're doing. Um, it's a process and this is just simply the start of it. So I will, I will be supporting this motion. Yeah, Councillor Proctor. Um, I, I have some questions. I do have some experience with construction because I'm married to a person that does that, but um, I'm wondering how in this process through you mayor to staff, when would a scope of work be looked at? Is it, um, would the scope of work come back to us with this um, expression of interest or, um, cause I, I know that staff is um, definitely qualified to create a scope of work, but I'm just wondering how that fits into the process. Uh, your worship through you to council and to uh, Councilor Proctor. Um, th this is simply a request that we do uh, an RFP for a request of interest. Uh, we'll, that will come back to council at that point. Uh, we'll select um, whoever uh, you know council chooses at the time, and then we can lay out the uh, probably to the um, uh, successful component the scope of work. Now, prior to that, you know. They're obviously for an expression of interest, they're going to want some sort of scope of work and it will be the design of a uh, new fire hall and a new public work shard. Okay, thank you. So the scope of work will, um, before the building is built, that will, excuse me, come back to council and we will take a look at it, rubber stamp it. I, I don't know how I could come up with anything better than our qualified staff could, but I'm just asking. No, that definitely. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. It will definitely come back. Thank you. And so those of us that want to uh, micromanage the planning would be able to do it at that time. Okay, so I have Councillor Gesselbrecht uh, as the next speaker. Um, Councillor Savage is uh, unmuted right now. Thank you. Um, in uh, 2008 till about 2013, I was a chairman of the Manus Fire Protection Society, which was the governance uh, council for the Manus uh, volunteers. And during that period, uh, we, we went under, underwent the same process to build a new fire hall, which, which ultimately ended up in a uh, more than $2 million fire hall, uh, beautiful project. But um, from my recollection, it was a long process and it had to start with this expression of interest to uh, get the ball rolling. Uh, and in fact, it was a two year process to get the, to, to start getting the shovels in the ground. So it's a very long process and I, and I doubt that this is gonna be any shorter. And so uh, I have to agree with uh, previous speakers that it's a first step. Uh, council will certainly be able to weigh in, uh, look at uh, what's happening, what, uh, what sort of designs, uh, what sort of uses. So I'm confident that uh, staff will uh, accommodate us in that. And so I'll be supporting this motion tonight. Okay. Any additional speakers on this item? Okay, so Councillor Savage. Yes, when you ask for a design of a house, you, you give the critical information. What's the budget? How many bedrooms do you want? 
what kind of functions and uses do you want for it? None of this has been decided. Just to say, oh, well, let's do a design for a public works yard. Well, for what? Is it part storage? Is it what type of building do we want? As I said before, what to what standards? The lowest building standards, or the you get a completely different design uh, interest, or you know, it, depending on what level of of architecture and and energy quality it is. So that we just don't have any of this information just to say, oh yes, give a design. Well you have to tell people what you want them to design. And I do not know what uh, is wanted in terms of design. Are we designing for the near future, the very long distance future? That's a big consideration. And also the key component, the first thing that you'll be asked when you go to get a house designed is what's your budget? And what is the budget here? We have to come up with that. So. Uh, it's, it's really premature. What is it going to hurt to leave it for one uh, council meeting? It's not going to hurt anything. And I've got all sorts of questions and ideas that I'd want answered. And also, we haven't even decided the ultimate use for this land, uh, what other uses we might want to integrate with it, and, uh, and so on. And a quick question, please, through chair to staff. Has this got any relationship to Village South this coming up at this time? No, it doesn't. Okay, thank you. So that's that's my thing. If you would please at least give it one more council meeting to get a more fulsome approach to this instead of, oh, just a fire hall and just the public works, whatever building, whatever it's going to be. I don't even know that. Uh, this is millions of dollars and I would like to get more information, to have a more informed decision on the design of what uh, for this millions of dollar project is going to be. And it's close to my heart uh, producing something of the highest quality. So uh, I just want to make sure when we ask for designs, we to what standard and for what? And those are questions I'm hoping can be answered. So please, can we just leave this for one meeting. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, and we'll deal with it at the next Thanks, meeting. Councilor Savage, I got to interrupt you there. You're about over three minutes. Um, I was going to just speak briefly again to this. I'm still like, I'm actually legitimately confused on the design. At the end of this, and perhaps staff can spell it out a little bit more clearly for me, like this request of interest of sorry this request for expression of interest like for for the facility to design like if um, if this is approved what are you, what will be coming back to staff and eventually the council or will we be getting an actual design coming back to us uh no your worship uh, uh through you to council it's it's simply a request for an rfp to go out for an expression of interest to do this work which would be the design of a future potential fire hall and uh, fire hall um, public work site on that five acres. Um, that's all we're asking for right now is an expression of interest that we have you know, people who are would come forward and say, yes, we're interested in doing that. That's it. Okay, so I, I just, sorry, I'm, I don't know why I'm having a hard time processing it. So really, you know, just for so I'm thinking out loud here, it's really to, ask for you know potential um architects or design groups to come back with design and or like yes we want to perhaps do this design work and then would uh, with part of that process would they then be giving us a, an estimate on how much that's going to cost to undertake such works or is that going to be a separate process to actually come up with an architectural design of uh, what these future buildings could look like now it's a request uh, your worship through you to council it's a request for interest. So would you be interested in working with the district in designing these facilities? And if so, what would your cost be? Okay, thank you for that information. So it makes my decision a little bit easier. Um, all right, so um, I'm gonna move to calling the question unless there's new information. Okay, hearing nothing, I will call the question. So are you, do you have a question, Councillor Wilson? 
Okay, so I'm gonna call the question, all those in favor, opposed, when that counselor Savage is opposed, that carries. Um, takes us on to item D. So we have the construction traffic. Um, this is uh, uh, Councillor Savage's recommendation. So go ahead, Councillor Savage. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is uh, this. Uh, do you want me to make the motion, or if you want to make the motion, and then we'll get it on the. the Floor and uh, that for the Community Safety Standing Committee meeting of June 8th, 2021, staff present some strategies to direct construction traffic for the foothills in Clark Med to a designated route up Ware Road from Highway 19. Okay, do we have a seconder to the motion? Okay, I'll second it. So go ahead, Councillor Savage. Uh, yes, thank you. This is uh, nothing more. It's just simply a request for the June 8 Safety Committee meeting uh, for staff to bring some ideas and possibilities of how to encourage construction traffic uh, to use the Highway 19 to Ware Road route to access the Foothills and Clark Med developments. Uh, we're not making any decisions tonight. We're just requesting some options for the safety meeting. And this sprang from, it's not just recently, I've heard this for a fair amount of time from various residents on Alds Road that it's really been uh, impactful to speeding construction traffic and uh, when you're tired and you're in a hurry and it's always bothersome when you've got to drop everything and go buy some more materials and so on, you're always in a hurry. I know this well, but uh, it, it's just, we have to think ahead. We've got so much development coming up and Clark Med and the Foothills, it's on the same route. So to avoid uh, trying to trim down the construction traffic that uses all, and we've had a complaint from Phillips Road as well, that uh, if we could come up with some route and the solutions may be to encourage, to request, it doesn't have to be a, an order to do so. I'm just looking for ideas. So we're prepared for the safety committee meeting because this is a very important issue and I think people are looking for a solution. So that's all. It's just to give a heads up of uh, item for the uh, safety committee meeting. Thank you. Okay, as the senator, um, yeah, I can support this motion. I, we've had I mean, a number of complaints regarding uh, some of the traffic um, that's uh, increasing uh, and it appears to be from construction crew people and so on. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, there's got to be ways of, um, of mitigating some of this traffic that's going up these uh, to these different building sites and so on. Um, and it's not to point fingers or lay blame or anything like that. It's just why not, you know, try and provide some of these companies, or maybe that's one of the strategies is provide each individual company that's going up there, you know, with information and just ask them to um, drive, you know, through a specific route when exiting at, you know, Lanceville um, or entering into Lanceville. So it, to me, it makes sense. It's, it's only going to get worse um, when that development starts going through and, um, we don't really want them buzzing through on Alds Road or Harvey Road and, and so on. Um, and also just to be mindful of the, of the neighborhoods they're driving through. It's, uh, again, hearing a number of complaints. Um, I, I just think sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's about trying to adjust the behavior and, and, and that's about it. So, again, I can support the motion. Uh, through the rest of the council, Council Gessebrock, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I, I lived at the intersection of Phantom Road and Alds during the construction of the Elm and Hayes Place, and uh, it, it was dangerous. Um, I don't think it's so much the professional drivers, the cement trucks, the, uh, the dump trucks that are uh, going too fast, basically, on Alds Road. I think that's the real concern. But um, 
people are, are hauling, are, are going fast on Alds Road. And uh, we did have the happy, happy and sad face there on Alds Road. And uh, that helped for a while, but there is, there is increased traffic. And I know some of the residents have complained. Um, Councilor Savage has pointed out an interesting gap in our traffic by law that uh, it was probably designed when all the uh, action, all the construction was going on in Lower Lanceville so that the uh, approved uh, route for heavy, heavy uh, trucks was uh, Lower Ware Road and Lanceville Road, uh, which has its own speed problems. But now the construction appears to be in the upper part of Lanceville, which will be the Foothills, Clark Med, uh, where, where Upper Ware Road at some point. So um, I think um, it, it will be interesting, and I think it's a good idea to, to, to uh, submit it to the safety committee. You know, uh, I don't think it'll be too difficult to encourage people to use the, the island highway and turning off at Ware Road rather than Alds Road uh, for anybody going to the foothills, especially. Uh, once Clark, uh, Clark uh, is open for construction, it's a little different um, strategy because when you come off the Island Highway at Alds, it's a quick turn in the, into Clark, but from the other end, the, uh, the Western end, uh, certainly where road is smart. So I think, you know, I think it's a good proposal um, uh, and so I can, uh, I can support this motion. Any additional speakers are likely to call the question. Oops, um, okay, so I'm gonna call the question. All the, did, sorry, is that your hand, Councillor Wilson? Or, oh yeah, just make sure. Um, I'm gonna call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, this carried unanimously. It takes us on to um, item E, so the Harbor Road Beach Access. So that's uh, one of your recommendations, Sawyer Savage. And if you just read the motion, get it on the floor. So you can leave out the whereases, just get to where it's. Uh... You got it. Thank you. Uh, that the Mabry concept design for the Harper Beach Road end be revised into the Harper Schedule A design and works as attached to the June 2nd, 2021 regular council meeting agenda. Okay, do we have a seconder for this item? Okay, I will second it. So go ahead, Councillor Savage. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So for uh, uh, basically you, uh, there's this architectural phrase, form over function. And all it means is that the design follows the practical intended uses and desired features of your project. So the number one in the survey we did uh, for the beach road ends for Harper is parking. And this function is not included in the design, it's being excluded. Uh, so 100% of parking at the road end with the Mabry design is being eliminated except a handicapped spot uh, on the, the road there. Has, and the road's been narrowed to one lane uh, for 114.5 feet wide for a length of 154 feet. And uh, that again is something that wasn't included in the survey. Uh, there's an expense of 200 foot sidewalk thereabouts, but sidewalks were not a category in the survey either. Uh, so again, the survey is being excluded from this design. And these are roadworks projects, I see sidewalks and road narrowing, that sort of thing, well away from the beach road end. And really is unrelated to the beach road end as a project in itself. Uh, so, and this sidewalk further eliminates parking, which was the number one desired feature. Uh, and there's proposed native trees to be planted on each side of the green space, but this will make the green space even narrower 
And the problem is will likely block the view of the neighboring properties with branches overhanging on the properties and, and so on. So <clears throat> my solution is just the, uh, uh, the simplest of, uh, of, of things. It's just simply uh, a rectangle of, of grass, uh, small, which all, all of it has an ocean view. And other than that, so it's just going to take some soil for that, a certain type of soil, nothing else. And it's for unloading kayaks, a sitting area, dining area, wiping sand off your feet. And then the only other thing is just to leave the rest of the road end as it is, but just de, you know, mark the park, delineate the parking spots with some removal of encroachment. There's up to 10 feet or so of encroachment there. And that's it. So the parking is, as you can see in the picture I sent, it's just haphazard. So if you delineate it so it's perpendicular to the hedge, occasionally you see it like that and it maximizes the amount of parking in there. So it'll be a very inexpensive fix and it will increase the green space and increase the parking, which is high on the list of the survey and be inexpensive. So that's it. It's just a simple, simple, inexpensive uh, improvement is what I would uh, suggest with all due respect to the Mavery students. Thank you. Okay, so I've got myself down as the seconder and then Councillor Wilson and Councillor Gesselbrecht. Um, yeah, with respect to the motion, it, it's this is an interesting um, motion that, you know, because ultimately it's, um, you know, providing input into the ultimate end design and, and ultimately how do we get to that end design? That's really the even bigger question um, and also taking it into consideration uh, public input and so forth, as well as local resident input and so on. One thing that's always top of mind when I look at these um, is I'm thinking like broad community. Um, you know, I wanna be respectful of the residents that are in that, those areas or that are joining properties. But at the end of the day, we're, we're planning beach accesses for the entire community. Doesn't matter if it's Lavender or Harper or any of them. It's uh, we, we have to look at our community. It's a growing community. We have 250 dwelling units going in uh, Clark Med at some point. We have, uh, you know, I don't know what the foothills end number will be, but we have at least 700 homes going there. We have all the growth that's happening in Nanaimo. And then we also, and a lot of it's apartment rental stuff. So people don't have backyards and they're avidly looking for places to recreate as well as, as, well as access the beach. Our beaches are no longer a secret in the region. And, and also to our own residents that will be, you know, in the future residents of Lanceville, we have to have adequate access to our beach beaches. It's that simple. And part of that access is providing adequate parking where possible. So the way the design is laid out, I, I like the fact that there's more parking. I just don't know about how do we eventually get to, um, you know, that end design, you know, and, and you know, where it's, um, it's you know, everybody's input somehow, you know, meshed together and, and we get that end product, you know, and how we're going to eventually get there without going overboard on it. Um, so anyways, I, I appreciate all the work uh, Councillor Savage has put into this and I appreciate the fact that he's coming back with a design um, with, or redesign to the Harper Road end or Beach Road end. Um, but I, again, I think the trouble council will have is, you know, how do we arrive at that final design? But again, top of mind for me is community. And, you know, and I don't want to sound ins insensitive to the residents that live or, or border or neighbor these beach road ends. But, you know, again, we, you know, the, within the design process, um, there will be respectful uh, steps taken to, you know, to try and maintain, you know, the, the quality of life those individuals have in that area. However, and then there's always a yeah, but or however, um, we still have to look at providing access to the entire community. So those are my thoughts at, for, at uh, first uh, onset here. Um, I think I had Councillor Wilson and Councillor Gunselbert. Yeah, I, I agree in principle. I'm just what you said is just like, how do you arrive at that final design? Um, 
I think that it was uh, pretty evident after the presentation that uh, parking needed to be addressed more so. And I think Councillor Savage has, has done that. Um, yeah, the question is how do we arrive at the final design? And just in conversing with some residents uh, this past week or over the couple of past couple of weeks and, and conversing, talking with the mayor as well, just regarding a couple of residents' comments, it's a multifaceted, uh, it's a multi beach road end solution that I think that we need to come up with. So, um, yeah, I don't know where, how we get to that final design. Um, I think with Councillor Savage, the spirit of your of your design is is good. That we need to have more parking, uh, but I think that this is a this is a solution that we need to take some time over the next uh, you know over the next three to six months to really kind of lay out, and then ultimately this would be stuff that we hopefully put into action next uh, next year um, when we do our financial budget. So let's not you know pin the tail on the donkey and put that solution in place today. Let's, we need to work at this. So I agree with Councillor Savage and more, and more parking needed. And uh, yeah, thanks for your hard work. I have Councillor Gusselbrock next. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, thanks to Councillor Savage uh, has done some hard work on this. Um, we also have had uh, several letters from residents uh, at the beach ends, at least one of them, with some other suggestions. Um, and I agree with what uh, Mayor Swain has said. Uh, we've, we're gonna have increased population and yes, uh, people in the rest of the area know that we're here. Um, I think we have to postpone a decision on this and maybe the postpone it to um, the time when we're discussing the budget. But uh, we may have to think out of the box on this. Um, suggestion might be uh, we close those major beach ends to all traffic, except residents who park there, uh, and except for maybe uh, one accessible wheelchair access, and uh, make it only accessible by bicycle and, and pedestrian. We can certainly put a lot of bicycle racks there. Uh, make it like a European city. Uh, where are you going to park? Well, downtown core has some parking. Uh, you may have to walk. You may have to take your bicycle. Because I don't think, uh, you know, everybody would like to go down there and park. There's just probably not room. So I think we need to, to think about this some more. Um, uh, and I think we need more input from residents. Uh, we've only had a couple. My understanding was that we were going to put the, the VIU students' uh, suggestions somewhere on our website. I didn't see it. Uh, I see that if you, if you use our search engine, it will refer you back to the last meeting where all those designs are. I would suggest to staff that we put uh, their designs and possibly even uh, Councillor Savage's designs uh, somewhere on the website that can be reached at uh, to give people some some uh, thinking examples, some examples of what people are thinking about. And um, so I am going to uh, make the motion that we postpone this motion until the second meeting in July which I believe is July 21st. Okay, so that's uh, second by Councillor Proctor. And really and discussion is limited really just uh, you know, time and place and then just uh, you know, the reason for it, for the postponement or, or basically referral or deferral, sorry. Okay, so um, I will call the question then. All those in favor? Okay, and that's carried unanimously. So it takes us on to the next one, which is the Lavender Road Beach Access. So go ahead, Councillor Savage. And again, just from, uh, you can leave out all the whereas is.
that phase one of the Lavender Beach Road End improvements be limited to making the district land west of Lavender Road safe and pedestrian accessible to the public. And th th this commences forthwith. And further that, phase two of Lavender Road and improvements includes revising the Mabry concept plan, developing, implementing both a parking plan and a road end plan and making further improvements to the area west of Lavender Road. And these commence over time. Okay, and seconder, you know, second it. So uh, through to Councillor Savage. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's just basically here that uh, I, I think the, the Mabry plan needs more work and to be, to be revised. Uh, and uh, I agree with Councillor uh, Gesselbrecht's sentiment if he wants to uh, postpone this one as well to give some thought, get some more public input and so on. But uh, the key is with this one is the uh, land that's already landscaped, the district lot is, is now fenced off and it's obvious it's public. So job number one is to make it safe. If people are gonna be accessing it, I just don't want someone falling into that drop off and breaking a neck or hurting themselves. So that's the key. If it's now accessible, let's make sure it's safe. There's very little to do. It's just the stairs and that drop off that needs doing. And I'll just comment a bit on the uh, uh, Mabry plan, if I may. And the survey, again, the survey parking ranked number one, yet all three parking spots are eliminated and, or sorry, yet all but the three parking spots are eliminated. And <clears throat> the proposed plan uh, list desired amenities approve walkability, but nowhere on the survey is there a category for improved walkability. Plus, why do we even need a sidewalk when people can walk through that beautiful landscape lot to the ocean? You don't need even walk on the road anymore. So I don't think that's needed and it would be expensive. Uh, the traffic calming, again, nowhere in the survey is there a category for traffic calming. So why do we conduct a survey if, if it's not being followed? So, uh, and the bike racks, they rank number seven, but I sure agree with bike racks. It's such a, uh, a small feature of a road end, but it's, it's good You leave your bike there and it encourages bike traffic. Uh, trees and native plants combined were also number one, yet the entire road end plus some is dedicated to a large barren gravel and dirt area restricted to only one uh, car. And to make it worse, this gravel area flares out wider at the waterfront, uh, pinching it in. So it, it means that there's 70 feet wide of green space, that's all. And yet there's, uh, I'm sorry, just 40 feet of green space, but 70 feet of waterfront with just all this gravel and dirt. Uh, that doesn't make sense uh, to me for such valuable waterfront. Uh, real estate and it in contradicts the proposal's intention of being pedestrian friendly. So whatever we come up with, I wanna see more green space. So the full width is beautiful green space for waterfront, that's 110 feet, that's great. Uh, so what makes more sense for residents is you drive down Lavender, then you turn left into a perpendicular compact organized parking space back from the beach. This provides lots of parking, eight spaces, plus three parallel parking spaces on the other side, unless we wanna leave those solely for the resident, which is fine that lives there. 
And the front of those parking spaces, you still get to view the ocean. So it's, it's a good solution that way. So, and when you leave this organized parking, you simply back out and drive back up the road. And this was the Coors plan. It was all engineered, all done. So I'm hoping in our uh, consideration of this, we also consideration that plan, it's ready to go. Whereas this Mabry is just nothing more than a concept drawing plan. So anyway, that's basically it. I've drawn the boundaries on there. So all this motion does is it draws the boundary around what we got to make safe. It's just responsible to do it as, as fast as possible. And the rest of it, we just leave as Council Gesselbrecht suggested for future consideration, take our time, go through it, but not rush ahead with any plan at this point, just uh, have more consideration. And if we have to just do it incrementally in small bits, you don't have to do the whole thing all at once. So that's the suggestion, thank you. And before we go any further, I just wanna mention there's six minutes left to the meeting. Yeah, well aware. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, from my office secretary, again, you know, through to Councillor Savage, appreciate the work you've done on this, but my comments are very similar to the to the last one with respect to um, Harper Road. Um, you know, the one thing we, we do have in our budget for the chair is we have the $9,800, and I think with that $9,800, we can definitely deal with the hardscape issues um, on the landscape portion, like fill in the whole rip out the stairs and do whatever excavating work to have a gradual slope, um, but that might be it. But I, I think it is something we need to draw our attention to sooner than later. But again, you know, here we are, we have this, uh, and I've spoken to this uh, in the past um, very passionately, and, uh, and it has to do with, you know, this is a waterfront park in Lanceville. You know, it, it's a great space. I was down there today and and I, I struggled with the whole concept of removing the all the parks from the front because I was one of four vehicles parked along the ocean front and I sit in my vehicle doing a telephone meeting, but it was a beautiful place to do it. And everybody else to my right was in their vehicles as well. So not everybody you know can walk to the beach or cycle to the beach. They drive to the beach and that's their enjoyment. They walk look out and can't help but notice that a lot of them are elderly, but um, that's just the way it is for some people. Again, I, you know, it comes down to the idea we've got to try and keep um, our beach road ends accessible to the public. Look at the larger picture, the, the look out what we think is that in the best interest of the entire community, while also being mindful and respectful to the residents who live near there. So it's not like we're suggesting let's put all the parking in front of someone's house. It's across the street. We're being respectful and mindful of that. Um, even the way, you know, the original design, or not the original, but the design from the students was, is having the cars angled up the road. Well, at least there's not lights, you know, shining in people's windows and so on. So again, there's just small little things like that, I think, show that there's been um, some respect and consideration taken for uh, some of the residents down there. But again, you know, I, I'm looking out for the, you know, as you, I'm sure all of us on council are, the, what's best for the entire community. And we have some big pressures that it will be on our on our beaches and our road end accesses and all that stuff. So mind you, it will be similar to even the other parks like even Huddlestone and so forth. Population's growing. So uh, mindful of time here. Um, I don't know if we just want to postpone this one to that same meeting and second meeting of July. So I'll make that motion. And is that a second, uh, Councillor Gesselbrecht? Okay. Um, any discussion on that postponement? Okay, hearing none, I will call the question. Okay, that's carried unanimously. Sorry, through to council, I'm not trying to get the last word on that or anything. It's just, I think the direction is pretty clear on these sorts of things. Um, we are running out of time. So um, through to council, are we going to go past 9.30 tonight or is there just by a show of hands, is there a hand? Uh, is there anybody who does not want to go past 9.30? Okay. So um, we literally have three minutes left in our agenda. So Councillor Savage, if you want to introduce your next one. Uh, yes, thank you. If I may, uh, could we just leave these so they're 
complete at the next council meeting. They'll be passed yeah. on anyway. I think it's best right. to do that. So, and thank you. And could I mention one thing, Mayor Swain? Go ahead. Yeah. It's a point of privilege. I had a motion approved tonight. Have you got the champagne or can I go out and buy some? Eh? Did you notice that? All right. So um, considering we are not able to finish our agenda tonight, we need a motion to adjourn. I'll just make the motion to adjourn, second by Councillor Gusselbrock. Any discussion on that? Hearing none. Um, uh, all the question, all those in favor? Okay, that's carried unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.